to bring new ideas and cutting-edge voices to discuss important issues, and today's event does just that. We are honored to be joined by Samantha Power, whose extraordinary career many of you may be familiar with. Professor of Global Leadership at the Kennedy School at Harvard, founding director of the Carr Center for Human Rights and senior policy advisor to Barack Obama, Power won the Pulitzer Prize, among many other awards, in 2003 for her book on genocide called A Problem from Hell. But Power's career has and continues to be rooted in her passion for journalism, for people who need help, and for writing about exciting and out-of-the-way places. And the subject of her latest book, Chasing the Flame, released just last week, shared many of those same passions. The life of Sergio Vieira de Mello reminds me of the new Indiana Jones trailer that I saw last night on television. As Samantha details in her book, Vieira de Mello's career pa parallels some of the most important humanitarian crises and foreign policy challenges of the last few decades. I couldn't help reading about the tension in Kosovo, which is a place I believe you may have, have met him uh, first in, in 1994, if I read correctly, uh, the past few days without thinking about the advice that uh, Vieira de Mello would have given the world community about what's happening there. Samantha is here to discuss Chasing the Flame with us today to be followed by your questions. So please join me in welcoming Samantha Power to the New America Foundation. Thank you. Samantha. Oh. I thought I could sit down. No sitting down on the job. Okay. Um, it's great to be here. This is actually my first Sergio talk ever, so it may suck. Uh, <laughs> I hope not. Um, I, I hope not. Uh, that would be bad. Um, Sergio um, uh, is somebody I did know. It was actually in Bosnia uh, that I got to know him in 1994, um, Kosovo's neighbor. And I have the same reaction you do reading the paper. Um, Jose Ramos Horta, the uh, East Timor's president, was shot and nearly killed last week in East Timor, a uh, place where Sergio worked. Kosovo just declared independence. What do we do about the fact that Serbians and uh, maybe even Russians are up in arms, metaphorically so far, but potentially even practically about it? Sergio, again, was there. Um, but I came to, to write this book actually because when I traveled around um, the country for the last book, for A Problem from Hell, again and again, and people would listen and they'd hear, okay, the United States' reaction to genocide, how it's not seen to be in the domestic political interests of American policymakers to do more in the face of those kinds of crimes. People would hear me out and say, yeah, 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 we know about the United States but, and, and genocide. We get it. You know, people on the left would say, you know, America, but it commits genocide. And why are you surprised that it allows genocide? And then people on the other side might say, well, you know, it's not in our national interest. And, you know, where's the national security nexus? And, and what, what's so surprising about, about your finding? But there'd always be someone in every bookstore, in every church basement, in every synagogue who would raise their, their hand in the back of the room and they'd say, we get this about the United States, but what about the UN? Why doesn't the UN do anything? I mean, isn't the UN the problem, in fact? You know, why are you asking so much of, of this country and not of the organization that was, was founded um, uh, in order to stop these kinds of things? And, and sort of exasperated and uh, perhaps overly impatient, I would say, well, you, you're absolutely right to ask that question, but ultimately we must remember that the UN is 192 countries, one of which is the United States. At that time, especially, by far the most powerful was the United States. And so as Richard Holbrook likes to say, um, blaming the UN for Rwanda, or for that matter for Iraq, for not stopping the war in Iraq, is like blaming Madison Square Garden when the Knicks play badly, um, <laughs> as they do uh, with some frequency uh, of late. Um, you're blaming a building. And I knew that that was only sort of part of the story. That wasn't the full story. I mean, there, there's plenty one can say about Kofi Annan's relationship to Rwanda or to Srebrenica or uh, how uh, the UN bureaucrats responded to the run-up to the war in Iraq. Um, there's plenty to be said about the institution itself and the, and the civil service that comprises it. But in terms of proportional responsibility, ultimately, uh, it was going to be the member states uh, that made the difference in people's lives uh, for the most part, you know, especially when it came to issues of, of uh, violence and, and security. Um, so, but that was sort of knocking around in my mind. And then in August uh, of 2003, of course, the UN was hit and Sergio was killed. And it struck me then um, that this 
friend of mine, and I should say that the Sergio I knew or thought I knew when he was alive is very different than the person I think I now know. Um, uh, I mean, what one learns through doing 400 interviews, I would not want anybody <laughs> to do this about me after uh, <laughs> something happens to me. Not a, I can't imagine uh, it's a huge amount of fun, but you do, um, there's also there's just a, an, a depth and a sophistication uh, to his intellectual life that I would not have seen because he was the fireman who was in uh, the world's most dangerous places. But, but these things came together, the sort of, the, the fact that Sergio died and seemed to have been, I'll talk about this in just a second, but a kind of receptacle over 34 years, a 34 year career, a receptacle of learning um, on the world's most violent places, that he was manifestly uh, the face of an organization that was very poorly understood, both by its critics, of course, um, but also by the people who worship the UN and who think the UN is somehow, those people who were asking me that question on, uh, in prior book talks, were people who thought the UN was the answer, that it could be the answer, almost a disembodied answer apart from what the states and what politics in the states uh, allowed. So the, these two things kind of came together and I thought, I thought here, here is someone who can allow me to to open up this system and to show that proportional responsibility and potentially to cast light on, um, you know, how it might be fixed. Uh, there's a lot of talk of UN reform here and there, um, and and so, but but to really get at the guts of it and not just um, at its kind of silhouette or its caricature. What I discovered, though, as I got into the project, was that um, that actually the UN was in some ways the least interesting and the least important um, part of Sergio's story and um, I, I mean for those of you who are world federalist members uh, there's still probably enough on the UN to tide you over but in some ways it was a venue um, for a man an idealist kind of Machiavellian idealist um, trying to deal with broken people in broken places and probably, um, you know, the only venue a person like that could have found work and could have been rewarded perhaps was the UN because um, UN civil servants were being sent to these kinds of places. But, but as I began to learn by walking in his footsteps over this 34-year career, I realized that actually, um, you know, the, the, the value of this life was in fact to try to distill the how-to part of it, uh, to try to spare us from having to make the mistakes he made over this 34-year career so we could kind of expedite that journey. And um, while opening up the UN system of course happens as you look at a life lived in that organization, what one sees is in fact that um, a lot of the concepts that we are bringing to bear um, in the 21st century are quite anachronistic. Um, they're better, uh, they are concepts and, and policies that would be better suited to a prior age. And that, that struck me as I, as I got into it, is that on the one hand, I mean, every single talk you'll hear in this town, you know, or have been hearing for the last 10 years, has began with some, uh, yeah, on national security anyway, or foreign policy, has began with some mention of the fact that all the threats are transnational, that no ch challenges can be handled by single countries acting alone, that viruses cross borders and terrorists cross borders and refugees cross borders and disease and global warming and, and so forth. And yet, still the models of who we read about and who we learn from are statesmen. They're people who operate within borders. They're Americans or they're, you know, heads of state or, or they're, we, 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 we haven't actually uh, developed ways of thinking that move us away from the statism um, uh, that is, again, I think, uh, a relic of a, of a prior age and is, of course, how our international organizations and so forth are still organized. So it's not entirely anachronistic, but it struck me that in Sergio's life, we had a, a person who crossed borders constantly. And in a sense, by being almost like a refugee himself, um, I mean, he was from Brazil, but, um, but when you work for the United Nations, as he learned in his greatest hours of need when he was dying under the rubble, um, working for the United Nations, in a sense, by working for everyone, you work for no one. And so there was no one from his own home state or, or home army, no rescue battalion uh, that could come to him that took his plight um, particularly seriously. I mean, I have to say that the Americans who tried to rescue him took the plight of everybody who was under the rubble seriously. But, um, but in a sense, he wasn't owned by anybody in that, in that hour of need. But in this lack of ownership in the hour of need, the corollary is that, um, you know, he amassed these lessons uh, not in a single state, not by working within a single political culture, 
um, but again by by uh, sort of scaling and sliding across uh, across the planet um, the statism the unilateralism um, definitions of success that we have we still have some idea that the there's a war on terror that can be won that there's going to be some on off switch someday we're going to say hey we won the war on terror you know again this is not a new point but um, I think the view of the UN in many ways is anachronistic um, uh, in terms of what it can be, who it can be for. Um, the idea of it as a messiah, uh, the idea of it as a punching bag, it's just sort of beside the point. And so what Sergio's life offered me anyway in this four years of, of talking to anybody he'd ever met um, uh, was a, a chance to think anew about kind of 21st century um, uh, solutions, I even hate the word solutions, but let's say remedies or ameliorators um, uh, for uh, brokenness, uh, broken people, broken places, and, and, and violent places, which is where the principal challenges and, and threats, of course, lie. So who, who is Sergio now? There's a lot of ab abstraction about the road to this place. He was born in 1948, died on August 19, 2003. Um, and for the most part, uh, where the news was, remarkably, he was, much more than uh, anybody who knew Sergio in life would have ever known, because he wasn't one of these people who lorded his past experience over you in order to win an argument. Um, uh, well, how would you know I was there, you know? Uh, he didn't really do that, and so I was stunned at just the synchronicity between his professional choices and where the world, the headlines ended up moving. I mean, even he would often get there ahead of the, the, the crisis, and I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, he was Brazilian. His dad was fired from the Brazilian Foreign Service um, when he was a boy, which uh, upset him greatly and kind of created a narrative for his life about states and about politics and how it couldn't be trusted. And, you know, his, he, he went to Paris um, uh, to study philosophy uh, because the Brazilian, after the military coup in Brazil, the Brazilian university system was um, uh, politicized and, and had become very shoddy. And so he went over to Europe in order to study. He spoke seven languages. Um, uh, while in Paris, he uh, was part of the 1968 uh, student demonstrations uh, against the, the state, against the police. He was beaten very, very badly and actually expelled from Paris. Um, he somehow finagled his way back in. I wasn't able to get to the bottom of that, but that would be a quality that he uh, would show in spades in dealing with such actors as the Khmer Rouge and, and the Bosnian Serbs and uh, even Mokhtar al-Sadr um, later in life. But somehow he found a way uh, to get back to Paris. Um, but when he graduated, uh, his idea of the alternative to the state was the UN, which is again interesting that that if the UN has a dualism, which is it is on the one hand those 192 countries I mentioned, but it's also where we park our principles, the principles that we hope will bind states and constrain states, um, principles of self-determination or human rights, peace and security principles that are often across purposes, uh, at least in the short term. Um, he he gravitated toward the UN, thinking it was a place where principles were pursued. And it would only be in the course of his career that he realized that until you can figure out how to work with states, those principles will just lie quite fallow on the page. So he went to the UN, joined in 1969, the year after um, uh, the Paris riots. Uh, he was only 21 at the time. He was the youngest professional staff member. He was an editor, French editor. Uh, didn't actually speak English at that point. Learned it on the fly. Spoke it flawlessly within uh, two years of joining. And then he starts moving, as I said, with the headlines. So the big issues, of course, in the in the 1980s that, um, or sorry, in the 1970s that that uh, the UN would have been dealing with would have been the wars of decolonization, and and the symptoms of those wars, the humanitarian symptoms. Uh, Sergio joined the UN High Commission for Refugees. Uh, again, initially as an editor, quickly became a field person, and the first field post postings he had were to places like Bangladesh. Uh, where, you know, in 1972, terrible things happened. He went, dealt with the humanitarian consequences um, of the uh, Pakistani violence there and the, the incredible fly, flight of refugees, at that time the greatest refugee uh, flow that anybody had ever seen. Then he went to Sudan, where the civil war that persists in different forms uh, to this day um, was, was going on, tried to facilitate the return of refugees from neighboring countries. Then Mozambique, the War of Independence there, uh, he went and was a field officer. Cyprus, um, uh, with the invasion, he handled the, the what he used to call the grocery <laughs> delivery. He was very kind of, even early on, I, I don't want to say contemptuous, um, but very diminishing 
of what it was he was actually doing. He'd say to the more senior people in the UN, you do the high politics, you talk to the states, I'll do the grocery delivery, I'll do the humanitarian aid, and I'll feed the symptoms of these problems. So he was already kind of on to something that would become a theme of his later in life. Then in um, 1981, he goes to Lebanon, and uh, the uh, Israeli invasion had occurred in, 19, uh, in the mid-1970s, and there had been a UN peacekeeping force was, of course, um, uh, put there at the border that was having trouble keeping the peace. Palestinians were uh, staging raids into northern Israel. Israelis were firing back. Um, he was only there six months or eight months, and then the Israelis, in fact, invaded, crossing the, the peacekeeping whatever barrier or whatever, it was just a bunch of people with, with uh, very lightly armed as it remains today in that um, very volatile region. Um, so the UN was, was trampled. Now, Sergio at this point, um, I have to say it was trampled going in both directions. It was, it was uh, uh, a part of a UN a mindset that has persisted today, which is this idea that just a presence um, will be a tripwire or that a presence can constitute its own deterrent or its own form of protection. Um, and Sergio was part of that presence, and it, because he was a person who took great pride in the UN principles, uh, he found it hugely humiliating to be trampled uh, in that way, and I'll just come back to that again in just a sec. But then in 1982, uh, or in 83 rather, um, the U.S. Embassy was hit by what we now think in retrospect was Hezbollah. Uh, this was the beginnings of Hezbollah, um, and Sergio was in Beirut at that time. Then the Marine Barracks, of course, were hit. Uh, again, if you want to look at the birth of, of the polarization or the, um, you know, the, the, um, the kinds of terrorism, the uh, terrorist acts that we're seeing uh, into the 21st century, I don't think 9-11 was the birth of that era. If one has to look anywhere, I think it's arguably in Beirut at that time. And again, Sergio was there. The wall falls in 89. Uh, he's the person tasked with dealing with actually trying to now patch up um, the remains of the Cold War. He's dispatched to Cambodia to facilitate the return of 350,000 refugees purged uh, during the Khmer Rouge reign and then in the uh, Vietnamese puppet regime's uh, reign. I get, then get to know him in Bosnia when ethnic conflict, sectarian conflict in the 90s was where all the attention was. He was there. He was the number two civilian in Bosnia. Then he goes to Rwanda and to Congo. Uh, not there during the genocide, but there when the refugees uh, flow over into neighboring countries and are being kept fed by uh, international aid organizations. Uh, one of those terrible dilemmas, uh, and it turns out Sergio deals with these kinds of dilemmas all the time, but do you basically turn off the spigot of international life support and thereby endanger the lives of hundreds of thousands of innocent people, or do you maintain the life support when you know what you're doing is in fact arming uh, genocidaire to live to fight another day? And of course, the, the right answer is you try to uh, separate the sheep from the wolves, but there was no one in the international system, no country that wanted to put their police or their soldiers in harm's way in order to do that discernment. It's not an easy job. Um, so then, you know, of course, coming up to the future, he was the Paul Bremer. Uh, he would not have considered himself that, but he was the, the so-called viceroy in both Kosovo, as I mentioned, and East Timor, Kosovo, for just a, a short time for, as a startup before Bernard Kushner. And then East Timor for two and a half years. He was the guy in charge. Then that's over. 9-11 has happened. And he's UN Human Rights Commissioner, so he's the person trying to, un trying to figure out whether with Guantanamo, with the setbacks on torture and so forth, how you work with the United States. How do, do you denounce? Do you try to get in the room? If you go in the room, the human rights community will turn their back on you. If you denounce, the odds of getting uh, another meeting with uh, senior American officials um, shrink uh, quite considerably. He was in Afghanistan at that time as well as human rights commissioner. And then, of course, talk about moving with the headlines. He's the person appointed uh, in Iraq to try to do damage control. And the damage, as it was seen from New York, was not merely uh, damage uh, to Iraq, because um, uh, at that time it wasn't uh, entirely clear just how badly things were going to go, but actually he was sent in large measure because of the damage that the invasion was seen to do to the United Nations and to perceptions of UN relevance. You had uh, President Bush and, and Vice President Cheney almost taunting the UN and saying, you're becoming a debating society, you're the League of Nations to come, you know, no one's going to rely on you if you don't enforce your own resolutions. And so Kofi Annan's judgment was that the only way to restore UN relevance was to put the best and the most knowledgeable, almost technical expert um, into harm's way, of course, but also into a situation where it was going to be very hard to get the attention of the Americans to actually get his views uh, taken seriously. So there was a lot of 
uh, disgruntlement when Sergio was sent by UN colleagues who said, wait a minute, you're going to validate this war effort by sending your very best? I mean, this is the go-to guy, but aren't there a hundred places in the world where people would be more receptive and more interested in getting his help? Why put him here in, in, into Iraq? Why, put, why send him to Baghdad? Kofi Annan's response, of course, well, if not, I mean, this is the hardest thing in the world to imagine getting respect for the UN and for, th for these technical ideas that need to be implemented in a hurry. Um, surely we can't just stand on the sidelines. If we have a chance uh, to do damage control here in both ways, let's do it. So he went, and, and by that time in his life, he was a kind of decathlete um, of nation building, um, to use a term that was once a dirty word in this town. Now I can't tell where we are in nation building anymore. But, um, but if you think of all the components of what it takes to do that, uh, well or better than not, negotiation, reconstruction, policing, justice, schools, elections, refugee returns, humanitarian aid, uh, constitution drafting, human rights. I mean, there's so many components to this. And sadly, very few of these components, as you know from the other books on, on Iraq, were, were uh, thought very much about um, by the planners of our invasion there. So when he turned up, he had this 34 years of thinking about these questions from all these other places. But it was hard on the merits uh, to get the attention uh, of Paul Bremer and to be heeded. Uh, there was a sense that at that time still, really all the way into 2004, uh, that the United States plan was, such as it was, non-plan plan, was the right one. Um, and he was rebuffed in, in, in very, key, uh, key, very key and very disturbing domains. Most of the recommendations he made were, were implemented, in fact, a year or two after he made them. Uh, but by then, um, unfortunately, the die had been cast, both for him and, and, and for Iraq. Um, I'd like to just, uh, I'm sure you have many sort of very specific questions about particular missions, or maybe none of you are here to hear, to hear about surgery. You just want to talk about Obama, in which case that's fine, too. <laughs> You're all sitting here patiently being like, okay, when do we get to talk about Obama? Um, uh, but um, I, I'd like to um, just talk, if I could, about about uh, five of lessons that I take from this um, sort of incredible life lived in, in violent places. And I think actually they relate a lot um, to Senator Obama and, and to some of the, the key components of his foreign policy as well. It's one of the things that I like about both of them. First, um, uh, I mentioned that Sergio was there in Lebanon uh, in uh, 82 and 80, 81 through 83 when these very historic events happened. One of the things Sergio did is he went running up to an Israeli tank commander who was coming uh, you know, around the, 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 the bend and, and, and into the UN camp, and, and he just said, you know, uh, what you're doing is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. And um, the Israeli commander just looked at him and said, you know, if you think this is unacceptable, you should see what I have, you know, around the corner. And, uh, <laughs> and Sergio said from that moment on, he never used the word unacceptable again. <laughs> and uh, I mention that because I think that there is an arc in his life. I view this book in some ways as maybe it's the education of Samantha Power, but it's the education of Sergio Vieira de Mello, the education of Henry Adams, that it's the education of an idealist in the world. And the stone throwing Paris leftist, revolutionary, the it's unacceptable. Um, he evolved, and I think he went uh, to a place that was actually, he evolved too, too far. He became very, very accommodating. Um, of uh, people like the Khmer Rouge, like the Serbs. He, he was so obsequious to uh, Slobodan Milosevic, he spent uh, an afternoon trying to find the perfect painting for Milosevic as he was leaving Belgrade. Um, when he went to see Radovan Karadzic, um, uh, the head of the Bosnian Serb, is still in indicted and at large head of the Bosnian Serb fiefdom. Um, uh, Karadzic had been a psychiatrist. Sergio went scouring and found a New York review of books that had just come out when it had a cover story on psychoanalysis, and he brought it to Karadzic. Now, I mean, a lot of this is just good diplomacy, and I think there's nothing on its face necessarily that's wrong with these kinds of um, tactical maneuvers, but, but what would happen is he became so accommodating that he actually often sort of tilted toward state power. He tilted toward those who had the power, that he was so desperate to get a deal at stages in his life, uh, surrounded by human misery, and so very much oriented toward, uh, you know, ameliorating the misery. But nonetheless, I think even he, he looked back and said, you know, I, I went too far. There's, sti there's still a way to be in the room, to not say, I'm not li watching, I'm not listening, you know, to not turn your back on negotiations but also to not forget what was done before you got there. So the man who was known as Serbio uh, in the Bosnia conflict at times, by the time of the Kosovo conflict, just five years later, um, he was very, very different. He was in the room 
never would turn his back on the possibility to try to find common ground. Um, but for instance, when the Serbian foreign minister tried to speak to him in Portuguese after he'd come back from ex sort of looking at mass graves in Kosovo during the NATO bombing, you know, he stopped him and he said, don't insult me by using my mother tongue. What I have to, to share with you, uh, you know, I don't want to violate my mother tongue by, by uh, speaking about it in Portuguese and so forth. So, and I just think it's something that we as a country, we as citizens are thinking about, grappling with. How do you on the one hand engage with Iran, Syria, et cetera, and not turn our back as we have, recognizing how unpragmatic the current current course is, um, but on the other hand, recognize that Holocaust denial is not appropriate, that support for terrorism is not appropriate, that you're in the room and you're tougher in the room than you are by throwing verbal grenades um, from 5,000 miles away from the room, but it's a balancing act, and I think that's the balance that you get to see in the arc of his life as he strives for the right balance, and no one will love the balance one strikes at any point, right? There's always going to be constituencies who don't like what you're doing, but I think actually learning with him is, is um, uh, very, it's a very interesting and troubling journey because you realize just how hard it is to retain your sense of, of, of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, while also trying to extract uh, compromise in the moment. Um, second uh, point uh, is, and I, this is maybe the most important, I think, um, and it was funny, I got rev a reviewer in the San Francisco Chronicle said, uh, you know, very good book or whatever, but when it comes to the prescriptions, power is surprisingly or disappointingly mild. Uh, for instance, she uh, says something about, a, uh, you know, offers some bromide like, we should support human dignity, <laughs> which, if we, so this is my second point, dignity. If we actually, as a country or as individuals, could actually think in terms of dignity as well as, uh, or even uh, before thinking about rights or democracy or all good things, if dignity were the, if one thinks about it as like a bicycle wheel, you know, the, the, the centerpiece out from which the spokes would flow, I, it would be revolutionary, uh, I think, actually. Far from being mild or a bromide, and Sergio offers a look at this, I think, um, throughout his career, both at a micro level. He was unusually good about actually seeing the dignity of the individuals in front of him. Sometimes people, even like myself, would talk about human rights or humanitarianism. We fail often to disaggregate human rights into humans, <laughs> individuals, uh, people before us. He was amazing that way, such that he was wiring money from Iraq to his cleaning lady in East Timor. Uh, even in Bosnia, when he was known as Serbio, he was stuffing people into the back seat of his car and smuggling them out if they couldn't get medical treatment that they needed, breaking UN rules or bending them severely. Um, uh, so this, to think about dignity, and, and I think he saw it in a macro way, though, as well. He understood in East Timor, he was the viceroy, and he understood, initially he believed that the UN comes in, it's the UN, everybody's going to welcome the UN. Uh, we helped get rid of the Indonesians, people are just going to love us because we're the UN. And, and he realized very quickly that they wanted to govern themselves and that the fact that you represent 192 countries instead of one or however many were part of the coalition in Iraq doesn't actually buy you very much if, if you haven't communicated to people that you're, it's actually about their dignity and, and respect, um, uh, you know, that that's why you're there. So he started to hemorrhage, understand that the best way to exercise power is to hemorrhage it. Not least because then if you share the power, you share the blame as well. So it was also strategic. Um, just three more points briefly. The third is simply, um, and this maybe will sound like a bromide, but boy, it's very hard to orient our political culture around it. He had an, a, a, an incredible humility uh, as he went into these places, partly because after years of doing this kind of work, he just knew how complex it was. And one of the key challenges for us now in the wake of Iraq and Katrina and our crisis of confidence and competence as a country is how do we simultaneously bring this humility that has been, uh, that we, we have in spades, or some have in spades anyway as a result of recent um, uh, debacles, uh, but not be paralyzed by it. Understand that you somehow have to get up again and engage in the world, engage in a very, very complex world. That doesn't mean, you know, invade another country or anything like that. I, what I mean is simply that I think especially among progressives, there is a temptation to go into full retreat. And I think that the possibility of retreat in a globalized world is, um, is quite slim. So how do you bring humility, an awareness of the complexity, and a kind of constant curiosity also about, about the effects of your policies? That was another thing, I think, again, that Sergio and Obama share is a sort of empiricism. Um, uh, where you're actually asking, is it working, again and again and again, and self-correcting to the degree that it's not. Um, fourth point, uh, this is an old one, but he, Sergio uh, came back uh, 
to Franklin Roosevelt's uh, key observation that if we could in fact live in a world free from fear, uh, we would uh, live in a much more stable and, and peaceful and prosperous world. Obama again has made this uh, a cornerstone of his platform. Um, but much one of the reasons that the results in the democracy promotion uh, initiative, the Freedom Initiative, Bush's Freedom Initiative, have been so uh, dispiriting is that when people live in fear, they tend to vote for the extremes. Um, uh, if you look even at the victory of Hamas uh, in Israel, uh, it's hard to see it. I mean, the, certainly there are some people who voted for Hamas because Hamas wants to wipe Israel off the earth still. Um, but, but there is strong evidence that the provision of social services by Hamas uh, and the fact that they were militant and actually had guns on the neighborhood block um, was, a, was a, a factor behind um, their success in the polls. And unless the international system and the UN and countries bilaterally can actually find a way to meet people where they're at, and try systematically, I'm not just talking about in the Middle East, but all over the world, uh, legal systems more often than not are tools of repression in developing countries anyway. Police stop you at the checkpoint and just say, can I have $100, please, thank you very much. When is that going to change? When are we going to start to invest in jails and magistrates and rule of law beyond kind of PowerPoint presentations um, uh, in boardrooms, but actually uh, the meat of, 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 of rule of law? Um, so he, Sergio's my favorite line in the whole book is, uh, fear makes a bad advisor, or fear is a bad advisor. And watching the degree to which we as a country have made bad decisions since 9-11, um, kind of stoked into this um, frenzy um, by our political establishment, we can't now go to the other place and say there's nothing to fear. It's a question of how to calibrate one's understanding of the threats. And then the final point uh, I just would make, and, and this is, I'm not sure that this how, how people will read the book, whether they can read it as, as being, I think, instructive for governments and for citizenship. Um, but to the degree that people look at Sergio's life as worth emulating, and he's a very flawed uh, and very tragic figure in the end, but there is so much in his learning, I think, and his adaptation that is uh, quite worth emulating, that capacity for self-correction that many of us lack. Um, uh, but but the, the fifth thing that I would say that I hope that it would inspire is uh, a commitment to service. Uh, Sergio didn't want to go to Iraq, um, but he viewed um, actually serving as uh, in the UN system as it happened, but serving the humanitarian good or serving the UN charter, however one looked at it, as uh, compulsory, as instinctive. Um, he actually went to Kofi Annan uh, and said, I'd like my name taken off the short list. I'm finally dealing with my marriage. I'm getting a divorce. The human rights community is very skeptical of me. I think we're going to be humiliated in Iraq. I don't want to go. And in the end, Kofi Annan made the judgment that he made that Sergio was the only person who could conceivably create a space um, for the United Nations, and Sergio was sent. And I guess, you know, given the way the story ends up, it's hard to make Sergio's decision to go and serve, uh, you know, a poster child for why one should get into service and see it as reflexive like that, um, needless to say. But there is something truly admirable um, about the way he treats, um, actually just treating the people around him um, with as if they have dignity, making everybody visible in the rooms around him. Um, that kind of egalitarian spirit has made me sort of see service as on a continuum, you know, from actually just uh, bringing those principles to bear more in our daily lives to the continuum of actually doing something in the neighborhood to, of course, actually redressing the discrepancy right now between military service um, and development, reconstruction, NGO kind of service. Right now that we're, we're uh, as understaffed as we are on the military side with people doing their fourth and fifth tours and so forth, we're woefully more uh, understaffed on the civilian side. And we have to think about ways of injecting civilian capital into the international system so that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Let me leave it there and answer any questions or, or comments you may have. Thank you. If you're moderating, I'll sit next to you. Yeah, I'll sit down. Let's, um, it, it's terrific, Samantha. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, I know folks will have questions, so let's, uh, I see a hand in the back. Yeah, I better stand. I can't see everybody. So if you wouldn't mind just identifying yourself as you ask the question. Um, 
Great question. Uh, uh, did everybody hear the question? Is was Sergio stands for the proposition that the UN can be made to work, but was he just he had all these exceptional qualities? Was he just a one-off? Um, is he in fact evidence that the UN <laughs> further evidence uh, <laughs> that the exception proves the rule? Um, I guess what I would say is what 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 makes Sergio. Um, kind of miraculous. And I really, I mean, the, the book is very hard on him in certain ways. Um, so I don't, I don't want to reify him. And I, there's nothing in your question that suggests reification. But um, as I said, I think the most compelling, his most compelling quality is this adaptation and the self-correction, the self-scrutiny, which then allows him to be, to kind of keep up with the times in a way that, that uh, the state system doesn't seem to be. Um, but the miracle of Sergio is that somebody with his charisma, with his seven languages, with his brilliance and his adaptability, um, that he would stay with the UN. So I think, and these are questions now, again, that's why I think this, is, while I could go on now about the UN system and how it doesn't retain people and how it doesn't um, uh, create the kinds of incentives one would want for people like Sergio to remain within it. Um, but while one can have that, that conversation at the UN level, one needs to have it at the governmental level as well, is how are we attracting people into public service and keeping them. Um, and many of the things, and I'm sure there are both past and present government officials, US government officials in the room, perhaps, um, I'm sure many of the things that career State Department foreign servants would say would be identical to that which uh, UN foreign servants would say, you know, big footed by political appointees, career people not getting the perks, family um, struggles. One of the reasons Sergio was able to be in all those, that ridiculous number of places that I mentioned um, in the height of conflict uh, is that he wasn't um, so sensitive to the needs of his family. I mean, he left them behind. These were not um, uh, stations, uh, overseas duty stations where you could bring members of your family. And for most people, that's a deal breaker at a certain point anyway. So at, at, at the time where most people's careers tend to level, uh, at least in the international system, in your mid-30s, um, for Sergio, you know, he just kept going to the more and more dangerous and uh, places and, and doing a more and more admirable job. Um, but there are real, uh, there's a real price to be paid for that. So I think both governments and um, the UN system need to think much more, and this is a kind of, <laughs> everyone has been saying this for years and it just never really gets done, um, uh, but about uh, how to attract people, especially at a time when there's private contractors and, and uh, you know, uh, corporate possibilities galore, what is going to be the draw uh, to an institution like this? And the tragedy, so many tragedies associated with Sergio's death, but had he actually been named Secretary General uh, eventually, whether uh, it, you know, on the Asian cycle it would have been a stretch to see how that would have happened. There would have had to have been a stalemate among the countries that were putting forth candidates, which eventually resulted in Ban Ki-moon. Um, but maybe the next cycle around, when it got to be Latin America's turn again, or maybe Ban Ki-moon um, would only have gotten one term. Who knows? Um, but had Sergio been um, uh, Secretary General, I think the, 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 the sort of throngs that would have been attracted to the institution, to this new face of the UN system, would have resembled the kind of throngs of people who I imagine if, if Obama becomes president, you know, also would love to suddenly just be in the, I mean, now people are starting to talk about it as a cult. I'm not somebody who believes it's a cult. But certainly to have a leader who makes the best case for service um, with all of its complexity um, can enhance, you know, who comes to you. And then, but there's a very difficult then subsequent conversation about how then once they've come to you, you keep them trained and agile and attracted to the institution that drew them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Dusner, I work for the U.S. Senate. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, some of the anachronistic uh, solutions to globalize. <coughs> I'm wondering what are your thoughts on changes that need to be made by the UN, but also by other NGOs and international organizations when faced with issues and problems such as we have in Iraq and Afghanistan, where uh, it almost seems that the opponents of order there specifically target mm. the UN to show mm. that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot in your question. Um, but I mean, I guess I'll just speak to the security component or this balancing act. You know, the we all, um, I mean, Sergio, again, his great line, fear is a bad advisor. Um, but on the other hand, fear might have been a decent advisor in Iraq, <laughs> right? I mean, if, if one had to do it again, um, Sergio would not have 
so willfully created the anti-green zone. That was his very deliberate intent. People say, oh, security was terrible. How could Sergio left? It was, it, you know, it was deliberately that way. It wasn't deliberate that his office was on the corner and so exposed. I mean, there, there are all kinds of things that should have been done, and I, I write about those in the book. But, but certainly the decision to make the UN headquarters not a fortress, to make it a place that people could come to check their email, that Iraqis would actually feel comfortable coming to vent their grievances, that he could take stock of the grievances, get a read on the Iraqi street, and, and even convey that to Bremer, who was so insulated and living a much more parochial existence within uh, Iraq behind all of his vehicles and so forth. That was a very, very conscious decision. Now, what has happened since August 19th is a lunge in the other direction um, toward more fortress-like um, uh, UN field offices and so forth. It's still nowhere near like U.S. embassies or, I mean, nothing, nothing comparable. Um, so I, I think this is, again, one of these where there's no there's no PowerPoint presentation plan for how you uh, do good in the world, in a world where Al-Qaeda exists or, or its kin exist, um, uh, and, 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 and simultaneously keep the, the, you know, make safety an, an absolute imperative. And so what safety is is an imperative, but there's the humanitarian and the safety imperatives that are dueling. And uh, there's a big, um, I mean, somebody else should write about it. I, I kind of lost steam <laughs> by the end of it, but, um, but the, uh, with Obama and so forth. But, but the, I mean, right now, the, the sequel to this book is exactly your question, which is what are the, even the, the questions one asks when one descends into a society? Uh, do you ask the questions of your staff? Do you, you know, we, we know that from Iraq, the Foreign Service, there was almost a mutiny as Condoleezza Rice began to try to redress this civilian military balance, to her credit, tried to redress it. And then you had civil servants or foreign servants saying, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't want not, you know, and then whether it was I don't want to go for that war or I don't want to go into that, those dangerous circumstances to do that minimal good. Because it's a risk-reward um, calculus that people are making. And I think right now both the U.S. government again and the U.N. system as a whole um, isn't sure whether it's top-down leadership that is being given and top-down judgments about whether you're in the red zone or the orange zone and whether people should be withdrawn or not, or whether the duty to make that assessment is incumbent on the, on the official or the, or the civil or foreign servant themselves. So um, one of the other aspects to your question, I mean, you can just tell how complex all this is, but the, <clears throat> the other fine line, of course, is that often in places like this, in Afghanistan and Iraq being the best examples, the only, the only reliable security one could get would be from the United States or from NATO countries. So if you seek out that ex assistance, then, of course, you're losing um, uh, even the claim to be, I mean, at least in the eyes of some, the claim to be an independent, impartial entity unassociated with um, a combatant, you know, in, in a war. So they're grappling with this, and I, I, I think it's a case, obviously case by case. But I, what, what I find disturbing is the degree to which some organizations are are leaving it to the person to make the calculus. I mean, I mean, there has to be, um, and there are protocols that have been uh, developed. But it also has to be said that this is you cannot make absolute security the condition for helping people in violent places. You just can't. But what you can do is, especially if you know it's a place where. Um, you know, radical Islamic extremists who've proved themselves willing to blow up humanitarian entities, taking that into account and not pretending as if simply having a red cross or a UN flag is, is inoculation. But boy, it's a balance. Yeah. Hi. So, Matthew, you did a great job. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Good to see you. Yes. Um, I, uh, I have a, an affiliation now with the Census Committee on National Legislation here. Um, I have a book that's coming out in a couple of months on American foreign policy after Bush. And it just strikes me, first of all, I, I did go and see uh, Barack Obama in Virginia back in November, and he was like pulling out so many themes from my book, including the title, which is Re-Engage. Well, don't say that these days, because he's being accused of plagiarism, so that would, that would go down very, very badly. <laughs> And you know, you, you ascribe this to Sergio as being one of his sort of central yeah. themes and lessons. And I, I sense may, maybe that all five of these lessons were lessons that you feel personally. Definitely, yeah. I also loved what you said about fear and not being paralyzed by fear. 
and I tend to think that the whole language of threats kind of just foments that, and that it's more useful to talk about challenges, because a challenge right. is something you can rise to, whereas a threat is, I mean, maybe it's just language, but I think it's more than language. Right. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that um, in our political culture, there's um, uh, the bandwidth um, it can shrink at times, it can expand at times. I mean, I think you've seen in the Democratic primary season a real spectrum of views on dealing with challenges and threats. <laughs> I think on the Republican side, you, you've mainly heard just about threats and just how big the threats are. and and how we have to double and triple the size of Guantanamo to deal with the threats. And, and I mean, I think that, that there, there are political rewards or seem to be political rewards by framing issues in, in, in different ways is my point. And I think what will happen, hopefully, um, regardless of I mean, whether Obama uh, or Senator Clinton win, and certainly with Senator McCain, is that I'm hoping we can have a conversation about national security that's in the center of the of, of, of the bandwidth because I think we have to uh, progressives have to acknowledge that the, that the threats are real now there are more threats genuine threats I'm, I'm all for challenges but more genuine threats as a result of decisions made fearing the ultimate threats right so there's a self-fulfilling prophecy problem with what the next president is going to be uh, handed um, but I think I think we have to be comfortable acknowledging that there are real threats mortal threats while also not allowing our entire discourse about how to engage in the world, or even uh, the bulk of it, uh, be framed in, in, in that way. Um, so, what, I mean, I think that um, when I talked at the beginning about the anachronistic unilateralism or statism and so forth, I mean, really what, what, is, what seems to be um, so central to the next administration, whoever it is, um, but is remembering just that how little I mean, I, 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 this is part of the cliche already. People are already saying this: a single, no single country can handle these threats alone. But, um, but to understand also that it's that you have to give to get a little bit. You know that you have to be a team player before you can be a team captain, um, perhaps. And and that can sound so kumbayaish and so, uh, you know, not what you'd want to say um, in 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 a debate and, and so forth. But as a practical matter. Um, that's what Sergio did, is he was the person, in a sense, going begging bowl in hand, trying to extract from each country, uh, n knowing that no country saw their full national interest as imperiled in the broken places, but that they might each have thought, like, a portion of their interest. <laughs> so he was trying to sort of take a portion of your interest, a portion of your interest, a portion of your interest, and kind of gather it and create a solution. And what, what each of those countries, I think, need to do, and, and believe me, I think whoever the next president is also is going to have to have a very difficult conversation with the people who've gotten such pleasure out of whacking George Bush over the last seven years about what they're going to do for the commons. You know, it's been so convenient to have this target, um, you know, not just sort of over-relying on the use of force and militaristic in that way and not just committing abuses um, that seem un-American, but also incompetent. It, it has given so many uh, democracies a, a pass on the challenges, uh, on the global challenges. And so who is going to be the president that's both going to go and be solicitous of their points of view and, and understand that you've got to put into the hopper in order to get out? At, you know, it's a little bit like a bank. You've got to put something so that there's something for the ATM machine to take. Um, uh, and that everything is connected to everything else. I think that's the other point, is that Obama talks a lot about um, just uh, you can't talk about uh, what to do about Saudi Arabia without talking about energy independence. You can't talk about uh, what to do about Cuba without remembering that Guantanamo is on Cuba. <laughs> you know that there, are, as you make as you make policy statements, the temptation is just to talk issue by issue. But but in a globalized world, all of these things are being taken together. So um, I mean, in short, I just think understanding that that this this idea of globalization is more than a cliche. It's, it's, it's where the solution lies, is somehow. And yet, you put this book down and you just think, oh my god, it's just so hard. And yet, I, my, my preference is always, if you're, even if there's bramble bush ahead, to kind of know what the bramble looks like is preferable. Some people just say, I don't want to look at the bramble. You know, I want to think that somehow we can make Iran, you know, keep its weapons of mass, mass destruction program where it is by um, by either yelling at it or you know doing this that or the other, and it, we don't we don't need other countries. You know we don't we don't. Fact is, if we're going to keep Iran 
where we think it's in our interest to keep Iran, we're going to need other countries by our side. Darfur is the same thing. Humanitarian crises, the United States isn't going to be the country doing the doing for the most part. It may be doing the transporting, it may be doing the paying, but who's going to do the doing? And how do you actually motivate them to do the doing? Um, I mean, it's a real, there are major leadership challenges, never mind the fact that you'll be managing, the next president will be managing two live battlefields that will be handed to him or her. I mean, this is, this is a, a very, very big set of challenges. And I think that the idea that Bush is, we get rid of George Bush and just change the driver of the car, <laughs> we got the car, the road, we got, a, we got a lot of work to do. Yes, sir, in the back. Hi, Will Davis. Oh, hi, Will. Uh, amazingly, somewhat, the UN presence in Iraq did not come to an end with the bombing and with the death of the mm -hmm. In fact, now we're increasing our role once again. Based on the work you did for your book and your role as part of Team Obama, what do you see for the UN uh, going forward with regard to Iraq? Well, I think that what what um, becomes uh, glaringly clear over the course of Sergio's life is that there are certain things where the UN adds tremendous value. And I, I think um, my hope is that the book can draw attention to those things. I know you struggle here uh, to draw attention to those things. But, uh, you know, the, the provision of good offices, so-called good offices that are actually seen to be good or credible. Uh, you see that with, with uh, Kofi Annan's work now in Kenya. Um, uh, and you saw it with Brahimi's work in Iraq, that there, he had much more standing um, to anoint people, it wasn't seen to be some pre-existing political agenda, you know, than uh, Bremer or uh, any of the military commanders or ambassadors that have succeeded him. The main um, technical skill, of course, the UN has brought to bear in Iraq, for which it gets painfully little credit, is elections. I mean, if you ask your average American what's the best thing that has come out of Iraq, or do you have any good memories of the war in Iraq, they'll probably say the, the tumbling of the statues and the Purple Fingers. And it was the UN, as you know, who organized those elections and who drew on, again, that experience that is accreted across many, many countries. And it, it, what I learned with, through Sergio is it's almost like a, um, a point about psychology as much as it is about, about policy. But when Bremer went in to Iraq, um, and Noah Feldman writes about this, and, and uh, basically anybody who was part of that first tranche of U.S. officials, they all write about how everybody was sitting in the plane, you know, scared and trepidatious and so forth, and they were all reading um, books about MacArthur in Japan or about the, uh, the occupation of, of uh, post-Nazi Germany. And as a result, one of the things they did is they're like, okay, what, would, what did denazification look like? Okay, let's do debathification. It looked like denazification, you know. Well, there, there was this way in which, if you've only got one data point post-World War II occupation, and then you have a, uh, a challenge ahead, I mean, this sounds so primitive, you would think that you would hope this weren't true, <laughs> but the temptation to think that somehow there is a one-size-fits-all solution to post-conflict circumstances or post-dictatorial circumstances, I mean, it's, it's madness. The great thing, and, and Sergio did it too, I should say, at the beginning of his career. I mean, he would say, oh, but in Sudan we did this. Now in Mozambique we've got to do You know, people would say, Mozambique's not Sudan. They may all be Africans, but please. And, um, and but by, that's what's, what I mean by this head start that he had making mistakes as well. So by the time he got to Iraq, and, and by the time the UN officials generally, to your more general question, get to places like Iraq, they've got, some of them, I mean, have as many as 13 or 14 missions behind them. Many of them, you know, it's, it will have three or four. Uh, most of them would have at least three or four. And thus, you're more prone to bring questions from one place to the next. So, so your question might be, uh, how credible are the exiles in this There's always an exile community in a transitional society, so how credible are they? Um, you know, what kind of military strength do the spoilers have? What will the costs of engaging spoilers be? What will the benefits be? Will it delegitimate a process in order to bring them into a process? Um, are there any traditional justice mechanisms that could be drawn upon where it's not us imposing our Western-centric model for what a judicial process looks like? Is there some, in Rwanda, like gachacha process or something? I mean, y y you don't say, can we do gachacha in Iraq? <laughs> you just ask, are there processes here that we can draw upon? And, and that, I think, by the end of Sergio's career, he, I mean, what tragically proved to be the end of his career, he just had this litany of questions. He certainly had examples that he could draw upon, and but he would pluck from, once he understood a new place, um, he would pluck from these past missions uh, 
those things that, that, that overlapped as far as they overlapped without overstretching the analogies and so forth. So, I, you know, I think in terms of political good offices and elections and obviously the humanitarian function in Iraq, I think the big challenge for everybody is figuring out what to do with the internally displaced, especially in the wake of a U.S. withdrawal. What are the, what are the channels for aid? And that, of course, has always been a, an issue for the U.N. as to whether it has province over displaced persons as well as over refugees and so forth. And, 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 but the, I think the, the special representative there now, Stefan Di Mastura, was one of um, one of Sergio's great friends, and I write about him and, and some of the ways they teamed up in the past. And he, it's just very interesting, given the point I made at the end about service, Stefan, I, I called him after he was named UN envoy there, and it's just, it's like, what do you, somebody gets named UN envoy, what kind of call is it? Are you, is it as if some, you know, you've just been told about, a, 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 you know, a fatal disease that they've just contracted, or, or are you calling them to congratulate them on this, on this big thing? And, and he said, ah, Samantha, I'm not sure congratulations are in order, uh, but all I can think about is what would Sergio do? You know, what would Sergio do? I must go, I must try and, and, and do what Sergio would have done. And his, the idea that Sergio had gone, again, over his own objections, uh, I think it, that's something that, that many UN civil servants take very seriously, that, that, you know, when asked, again, like a soldier, that somehow you, you have to go. But no one envies either the UN officials or the American officials who are dealing with Iraq right now. Yes, ma'am. Diane Perlman, I'm a social scientist, I study cycles of violence, terrorism. Um, well, humi um, dignity, the other side of that is, of course, humiliation, and there's a lot of literature on the right. relationship between humiliation and escalating cycles of violence. And also what you said about fear, um, that also, uh, you know, people are more dangerous when they're afraid. We're more dangerous when we're afraid, and there's also a body of literature, like terror management theory about that. And a lot of the common policies are we have to make them afraid, we have to threaten them. Like our foreign policy is basically going after bad guys. Right. And I appreciate what Obama says about that we have to change the mindset mm -hmm. that got us into war. And I guess we're already getting it, but you could expect that he's nominated being taunted a lot for like not being tough enough and being soft on defense and policies like tension reduction or security assurances that are more associated with reducing violence or right. framed as like appeasement or we can't right. do that. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how, and I'll cite my his policy, his advisory team a lot, um, like what he's thinking about other, how to deal with that, those kind of charges char yeah, of like appeasement. Yeah, charges that the American public right. are seduced in to believing. And, and I guess the one thing that I had some concern that he said about was about attacking Pakistan and yeah. Ideas, so. so, just so I get it, so the question basically, how, how uh, if you do want to engage constructively or if you do believe that fear is a bad advisor, how do you avoid being caricatured as, in a, as a Chamberlainian um, um, wimp or something? Um, well, I mean, he's, it's going to get much worse if he becomes a nominee when he becomes a nominee, but um, the, uh, <laughs> you know, just, if you say Go it, it can be true. Yes, we can. <laughs> si se puede. <laughs> uh, but, um, but if, you know, when, when that happens, obviously the, the, uh, the attack machine on the other side is going to be much more ferocious than, than that which we've dealt with. But the good thing about going up against the Clintons is you do get some practice. <laughs> it is, uh, it, it is, it is an, an impressive uh, machine. And, um, and so I think that he has gone, th you know, I, I think this has been a good toughening um, process. Uh, as you know, she disagreed with him both. Uh, on his uh, uh, statement in the YouTube debate, I think one of the turning points really of the of the campaign, if not the turning point, was that YouTube debate where they disagreed on whether to talk to our adversaries uh, unconditionally. And Obama said, "I'm actually not afraid of Ahmadinejad, and I don't think uh, if you go into the room the right way that you do necessarily give propaganda victories to your adversaries. You obviously have to be very careful about it." Um, uh, but one of the things I want to do is get the international wind at our back again, and by showing the world that a dictator of his uh, particular uh, qualities um, is the problem, we will then be in a better position if we can't reach any common agreement on anything, which may well be the case, um, to get international support for sanctions and so forth. I think he'll come back um, again and again with 
the sort of pragmatic case for why, I mean, to some degree, meeting with our adversaries is being portrayed as an end in itself. And what Obama's talking about is actually, no, it's about changing uh, the situation in a region that is not exactly um, uh, right now positioned auspiciously for the United States, Iraq, Iran, um, et cetera, finding out ways of, if there are areas of overlap, we have to deal with the refugee challenge in the region that requires figuring out how to deal with Iran. We have to deal with a political settlement. The government in Baghdad is basically an Iranian-backed government. You've got to find a way to deal with Iran. So I think that when he puts back the challenge, um, whether to Senator Clinton or to Senator McCain, about how do you actually deal with the problems in the way that we've been dealing with it, when he points to the record of uh, an absence of success by pursuing the position of we're not talking to these people and, and by writing people off as evil, um, which just alienates the rest of the world, you know, I think he's a lot to point to empirically that shows that the past way of behaving hasn't, hasn't uh, achieved what we've been looking for, for for national security. On the Pakistan thing, I mean, that people, again, thought that that was somehow a way of offsetting what he had said about talking to dictators, that he needed to look tough a week later, a week after having said he'd be in the room. But it was, it was actually that the NIE had come out the day before showing that uh, al-Qaeda's top leadership was in northwestern Pakistan, and we're giving a billion dollars of uh, assistance to the Pakistani regime which was rapidly losing support with its own people, as we saw yesterday, um, uh, and will continue to see. Um, but moreover, that we were not asking critical questions of Musharraf, basically, is this military assistance being used in order to do what we're giving it to you to do? And one of the things that didn't get headlines was Obama then went in and looked at um, what Musharraf was, was using U.S. military assistance to actually buy. And a huge part of the the <laughs> the dividend was anti-tank weaponry, you know, and allegedly that this is military assistance to be used against Al Qaeda. Well, Al Qaeda has a lot of things, but tanks they don't have. Uh, last I checked, anyway. And and so I think what you're going to see is a, a a real pragmatism on his part. And I don't think you can draw conclusions from. Uh, policies in one area, you know, the willingness to talk to your adversaries, to never negotiate in fear, but never fear to negotiate, it doesn't mean um, that you're going to let Al Qaeda uh, persist in, in some part of the world or tolerate a relationship where we hemorrhage money at a time of great fiscal overstretch in this country to a regime that's not doing with the money uh, what it said it would. Let's see how we are on questions here. How many more questions do we have here? Well, we'll take uh, these three questions right in a row, and then we'll have Samantha answer um, as we go, and then we're going we're gonna to come up against her together. So, uh, gentlemen here, and then here, and then here. Thank you. My name is David Young. I work for the UNDC UN Development Program here in Washington. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Can I ask you, Samantha, to expand a little bit on your, uh, your five lessons that, that you felt Sergio learned during the course of his long productive career? In particular, one could take away from your five lessons, perhaps, personal lessons, individual lessons, or how to be an effective diplomat, multilateral diplomat in the age of globalization. How, how do you think, let me press you a little bit, would there be a six or a six through ten in terms of institutional <laughs> lessons? And as a UN official, I have a particular interest in this. What do you think Sergio's, where does his arc of self-learning end? Where is the end of the rainbow in terms of institutional reform? His death, the whole episode in Iraq led to a rethinking, a kind of rethinking of the relevance UN among UN leadership. Uh, Kofi Annan, as the outgoing Secretary General, had a whole platform called the Larger Freedom. Much of it didn't get passed because he was on his way out. What would Ban Ki Moon, a new US president, what should they think about in terms of overall institutional reform for the UN that would make it in your next book more than a venue for a no, no. never again? <laughs> the phrase never again uh, was never again. <laughs> never again. What would make it more of a yeah. venue okay. or backdrop, but truly the primary forum for tackling the challenges of globalization. Yeah. All right, so we've got a question on other lessons, 6 through 10, et cetera, for the UN. Then, uh, sir, do you have a question? Yeah, let's just go, let's go all Yeah, we'll do that. Now, he's trying to discipline the speaker, yeah. not the <laughs> question askers. I'm Steve Shemp, I'm the leader of the government. Uh, President Bush is in Africa right now. I've noticed that he's been quite liberal using the genocide word. It was very different from the Clinton administration where they couldn't bring themselves to do that. How do you, what do you think explains that change? And kind of the second part of that question, uh, what should the United States be doing in areas like Sudan and Congo and the genocide area? Okay, great. So genocide and what we should be doing in Africa. And one final question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get back to the learning issue. 
question has to do with uh, how does someone who's trying to select a candidate, who is a person who uses learning, is self-adaptive, can uh, make the adjustments that are necessary, how do you discern that in candidates? How do you hmm. get past the, uh, you know, the, the buzzwords and the 30-second spots and, and the, the staff? How do you yourself, uh, when you look at someone who's a prospective candidate, determine for yourself whether that individual has the capacity to do the kind of learning that you described? So you Great. So our three questions, we have Samantha Power, past, present, and future. We have a question about genocide, we have a question about Demela, we have a question about Obama. We're not picking a president. <laughs> I know, but, but I have a feeling no, that that's great. Goes. That's, that's interesting. Um, okay, so, uh, well, maybe I'll do it as David suggested. So first the G word, what explains it? Um, and has, has he used it um, outside the Darfur context? Did he use it in the Kenyan context? I didn't. He used it twice. Did he? Okay, I, I just was curious, and I can Google after I leave, just because I, I, I know he uses it um, in the Darfur context. Well, first of all, uh, I mean, just a brief window into the anti-genocide movement um, and the discussions we had back in 2003 and 2004 about whether it was worth putting a lot of effort into getting President Bush to call what was going on in Darfur genocide. And I just say that I um, uh, was not for putting a lot of effort into that area and my great my best friend in the world John Prendergast and co-conspirator um, and I used to have these you know discussions and these arguments and um, my reason for not wanting to do that was um, it'll get to my response to one of the other questions but um, was that with the world this polarized and given that actually the definition of genocide is it, p reasonable people can disagree and that the Holocaust and Rwanda are in one place in terms of an outright extermination of every member of the opposite group, and then destruction, which includes mass killing of the kind of Iraqi, of the Kurds, or of uh, the Sudanese government of Darfur. But there's, there's some space in between there. My feeling was given the amount of polarization in the world that people, if George Bush said it was genocide, just about everybody else would try to take refuge in some other place. And this isn't to be gratuitously critical of Bush, it's simply to say, since people aren't trusting what comes out of our mouths these days, to just to introduce a word um, that was just going to generate a debate for six months about whether the word should or shouldn't have applied. I mean, again, if it were a Rwanda-style situation where no one could disagree, then um, then I, I would have had a different view of it. Anyway, it actually happened the way that I had feared that it and 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 but but one concern I didn't have also materialized. So it was a double whammy. Um, but there was then Kofi Annan. Then as soon as we used the word genocide, Kofi Annan appointed a commission in order to decide whether it was genocide or not. Whereas for me, that entire six months should have been all about what, what are we going to do about the massacres, the rapes, the humanitarian, the shrinking humanitarian space, and so forth. So I think that for once, and I'm usually not such a great prophet about it with things, how things are going to unfold, what I hadn't, uh, so I, I happen to have been right in that instance, but, but the, way, the thing that I didn't foresee at all is the degree to which using the word genocide, instead of becoming a trigger or a springboard for action, became a substitute for action. I mean, this administration is taking, I mean, I'm not surprised, and it would be surprised if he only used it twice. He'll be using it every <laughs> other word. He actually thinks it's a policy to call it genocide. And I understand why he thinks it. I mean, one of the points that I made in my last book was that the toolbox has remained shut, and even the, t the mild tool of using the word genocide is not one that's employed in the face of Rwanda or Bosnia or whatever. So if, the, if that's true, then maybe the corollary is that that's a tool. And in terms of what should be done, it's hard to disaggregate the conversation about what the United States can do for Darfur from the larger conversation about, um, you know, uh, what to do about detainees and whether to renounce torture and how to get out of Iraq and so forth. Like, this is my larger point, is that everything is connected to everything else. But as, as difficult as it is for us to be a moral leader right now on genocide, no one else is stepping up to do that. And so it's still essential. Um, that at a time also when President Bush is very concerned about his legacy and where HIV AIDS is, uh, should be a proud part of his ag legacy, Sudan has the chance to be that as well. I mean, the, the, the North-South deal, as shaky as it is, is still kind of barely sticking. Um, uh, we've spent $3 billion, George Bush has spent $3 billion of aid propping up the camps uh, in Darfur and in Chad. Without that aid, it's not at all obvious that European governments would have come to the rescue. Um, but what is needed is much more high-level attention to the peace process and not simply getting a Security Council resolution passed at the United Nations saying 26,000 troops should go, but actually 
being willing to transport those troops, being willing to train the troops, going door to door behind the scenes to extract troop commitments from countries that actually have troops capable of performing in, in, in tough circumstances like this, giving helicopters, leasing helicopters to the United Nations, not something the United States has done. So there is such a disconnect between the use of the word genocide and, and, and the resources that are being deployed behind the scenes by this administration. <coughs> Um, I would, if that disconnect were squared, I still think we might come up a little bit short insofar as I think it's hard to be for waterboarding on a Monday and against genocide on a Tuesday and then show up in an international institution on a Wednesday and expect people to, to think that you're serious. But I think we could make, we still make a huge amount of progress that we're not yet making. Um, uh, second, um, this water step six through ten. I mean, I, I'd love to talk about this more uh, behind the, 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 you know, or when, when we're finished. But, um, you know, I mean, there are lots of things I could say about uh, uh, Security Council reform and about management reform and so forth. And I think both of those were are necessary and were both hostage to the polarization in the world as a whole. I mean, in some, I feel like the whole way we've talked about UN reform over the decades has just been wrong. We've talked about it. Everybody, you know, every five or ten years, everybody gets together in New York. The the states who are represented there have never had robust conversations in their capitals about how to fix the UN, they just come and they're five or ten years older. <laughs> and, and, and the power dynamics have changed, but they just show up and then they're like, okay, can we agree now? No, well, we didn't agree ten years ago and we're, we're not agreeing now. The world's problems are worse. Um, we're less equipped to handle it. And, but we can't evolve because nothing's happening in the capitals. So my friend Jonathan Moore, um, who was with UNDP for a long time, <laughs> at one point just said to me, as I was, I was like, well, what can be done about the UN? And he, he's like, Samantha, you don't understand it. The UN won't fix. We fix. We have to fix. Which, which, but I, but I want to make a second point with that, which is that that can be an alibi then for people within the UN culture, right? Is that what Sergio did is that he didn't, uh, tolerate the red tape uh, to the extent that it, 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 it hamstrung him so he couldn't help people. I mean, if it came, he was so creative in figuring out how to bend the rules. As you know, one of the most ridiculous, forgive the indulgence, David, but it's just so ridiculous, I have to say, it. one of the most craziest UN rules for peacekeeping missions is because, I mean, I understand it's logical. They're all logical in some way, but um, because peacekeeping dues are assessed and you just give X percent of your budget if you're a member state, so in our case, what is it now, 22 percent or something or 20 percent, um, everybody, all the UN experts will tell me, but uh, whatever it is now down to, we give that percent. And because it's just taken, um, the, it's, they're very, very stringent. The member states are very stringent about on what the money can be spent on. So when Sergio went into Kosovo, for instance, um, it, right after NATO bombing, what he desperately wanted to do was to pay civil servants. But no UN peacekeeping money can be spent on civil servants. It can only be spent on UN things. So it can be spent on the salaries of UN employees, vehicles for UN employees, computers for UN employees. When he was leaving East Timor, he was handing over to Shanana Gusmao and, and Josie Ramos Horta and, and the, the kind of the current uh, political class. And he wanted to give vehicles, UN vehicles, to these people, or computers, or even just leave his couch. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, no. The rules are the rules when something has been spent on UN personnel. I mean, well, in these rules, it's going to require a combination, again, of people in capitals to start finally paying attention to how uh, we're going to get worse outcomes if we keep these rules in place, but it's also going to take a more a more cohesive internal movement of, for a dissent. What Sergio did was he, in order to build Timorese roads, no one could travel in East Timor for the two years that he was there. So what he said was that UN vehicles were, um, that their tires were getting blown out because the roads were so bad. So the only way that UN vehicles would not have to get their tires replaced every five minutes was to pave the roads in East Timor. And he did that in order to, <laughs> To, to be able to get the money uh, from the peacekeeping budget, which was much quicker, uh, much more quickly dispersed than the development budget. I mean, there is a, a separate story to this, which is why is development assistance so slow to be, um, uh, you know, put in place. Final um, question, uh, how do you discern um, which candidates have this uh, adaptability and so forth? Um, it's a great question. One of the most gratifying reads of, of uh, Chasing the Flame was, was that given by Doris Kearns Goodwin, um, who I know, fellow Red Sox fan in, in, in Boston. And, and, um, and she read the book and she's like, this is a book about leadership. You know, she's just written this big book on Lincoln. 
and she was asking, in a way, a version of that question. You know, we've got to think about how we take Lincoln and Sergio. And I'm like, oh, I like that. Woo, that's going to be good for sales. Uh, you know, we've got to think about like, how we distill these lessons of leadership and how, your question, how do you see, how do you find these things um, ahead of time so you're not learning that they don't have those qualities at a time of crisis. I haven't, I'm new at this, as you know, and, and, and so I haven't thought about it perhaps as much as I should have, but um, what, what, what I go to in Obama, what I went to in Sergio, is this empiricism, is this um, freedom from ideology, uh, a certain, um, just a, a willingness to actually ask what will the effects be, how do we know the effects, we know we're operating on the basis of imperfect information, uh, the fact that we've always done things a certain way, uh, doesn't mean you automatically do things the opposite, but it, you, you can't be encumbered by that. Um, the fact that he's not beholden to focus groups. I mean, when Obama opposed the war, um, and I recognize your question is broader than Obama, but when he opposed the war in 2002, every political consultant was just saying, Obama, like, no, you've already got the name Obama. Like, don't, <laughs> you're really going to stand up and oppose this war at that time? And, and just the fact that he would have had the courage of his convictions at a very difficult time. And, it, and believe me, I mean, he, 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 people say now he's a state senator, what difference did it make? Illinois was a liberal state. Well, even in a liberal state, the war had 70 percent uh, approval ratings. Um, so I think that, you know, to, to be less beholden to other things and to have a certain centeredness, I would also say that, um, uh, and this I don't know how you game this, but the degree of turmoil that Obama lived in his in his life growing up and the amount of growing he did and the kind of the way that left him both capable of crossing borders and centered that's something he and Sergio also share just that you know once you've it's sort of like a Darwinian point um, and you could say this about Senator Clinton as well of course and certainly God knows about Senator McCain um, and I think all of them would be great leaders in certain ways but um, even if one dis disagrees about the policies there are, there are qualities uh, of leadership that they probably all bring to bear, but but Obama, one of the you know when he goes into a room, I often think that uh, Bill Clinton in 1992, if he'd had his choice, I, I, mean, I don't know this for a fact, and I don't know President Clinton personally at all, but I, I feel like he wouldn't have gotten off the bus. Like he loved the bus, he loved being on the bus, you know, and and he loved the love. It it is hugely encouraging to me that Obama neither needs the love. Um, nor even necessarily loves the love. I think he, I think, you know, part of what he has always said to us again and again is, this is so not about me. Like, people have been, since 9-11, they've been desperate. They've been waiting for the call to do something and to be a part of something bigger than that. I mean, people on 9-11, or September 12th, lining up to give blood. Like, they're giving part of themselves they want to help so badly. And what Obama has done is kind of created a space where people can go. And so that kind of self-awareness that it isn't, you know, he's, he's not he's starting to think that he's the sum of this, of this movement, to me is very encouraging because God knows when things go, go badly, you also want to be able to retain your sense of self and, and, and conviction and so forth. So that's more biased in Obama's uh, direction than I intended the answer to be. But, but in both of them, I think that capacity to deal with adversity and be grounded in one's own skin is, is something that's quite rare in, in, in public life, sadly. All right. I, uh, appreciate, I thank you for your questions. I know there are books available outside, and some of us are going to talk afterwards, but uh, Samantha has a busy day, and I want to, uh, you to join me, please, in thanking her for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.